What's going on, everyone? Thank you for listening to The Incline. This is Kevin Klein here. Very fired up today because your Los Angeles Dodgers are coming off a very commanding sweep of the San Francisco Giants. They're now 49-31 and 31 on the season, and they're a game and a half back of those nasty Giants. We got a packed house today. We got a lot to cover, but I'm going to kick this one off with Jake Reiner. How you doing? I'm good. I'm really good. I think after the Dodgers got their asses kicked by San Diego and then got no hit by the Cubs, I think that was rock bottom for this team. And they were able to rebound, and they've ripped off five in a row. They were able to take the next three against the Cubs and then sweep the Giants, which was awesome because nobody else across Major League Baseball can beat the Giants except for us. And we gained a lot of ground. We're only a game and a half back. Just a great way to go into this off day. Absolutely. It's about time those Giants got exposed for the frauds that they might be. <laughs> David Rosenthal, how you feeling out there? Good, Kevin. Uh, you said it. I've said it on this podcast many, many times before. I, I still think the Giants are frauds. Uh, I, I just refuse to believe that Descalfini and Flores and Solano and Wade and all these bums are going to carry them to a division title. I just refuse to believe it. Uh, the Dodgers handled them pretty, like you said, it was a very commanding two game series win. In my opinion, uh, the score made it seem a lot closer than it actually was. Uh, you know, you'll look at the hits were similar, but if you watch the game, uh, it looked like the Dodgers were in control pretty much the whole time. Uh, they, they squandered a lot of opportunities. They held the giants hitters to O for 19, I believe with runners in scoring position. Uh, so basically the giants didn't, giant that series uh and it, it, it worked out you are correct they definitely kept them off the boards when runners were in scoring position we're also joined by the mastermind behind dodgers debrief and a writer for dodgers tailgate he's also known as one of the, one of the most positive fans out there on dodgers twitter <laughs> it's sam Shearer. welcome to the show thank you guys so much for having me i'm really excited to be on the show i've been a fan of the podcast for a while well, we're excited to have you as well. So I want to kick this one off with Walker Bueller because he had a month of June to remember. He went five and one. He had a he had a, a 185 ERA on the season. He now has a 235 season ERA. And he's pitched 103 innings with 100 strikeouts. Walker Bueller's just absolutely been dealing all season. He's been the most consistent man in that rotation. And he is my pick to represent the Dodgers out in Colorado because he's been phenomenal. What are your guys' takes on Walker Bueller? in his first half thus far? Well, it's clear to me that he has kind of emerged as the ace of this staff. And when you look at the Dodgers starting rotation as a whole, they've been, it's pretty much been the most consistent part about this team throughout the entire season. The offense has gone hot, has blown cold. The bullpen has been shaky at times, although recently they've been pretty darn solid, but the starting rotation has never wavered at any point during this kind of up and down season. So for Walker Bueller to emerge from this sort of star studded uh, starting rotation, it's just been a pleasure to watch. And it's something that Dodgers fans that follow this team that watch this team closely have known for a long time. And I think he's going to get the recognition he deserves across major league baseball. If he continues to do what he's doing in the regular season, we know what a big postseason pitcher he is. And we know um, when facing elimination, you'd want to have Walker Bueller out there every single time, hands down, but it has always been a, a mystery. If he can put it together during a regular season for the long haul. And, and I think he's going to do it this year. Yeah. I mean, you, you said it, you, you heard those numbers in June. Uh, he's gone six innings in every start this season. Uh, he's only had two starts uh, that, where he's given up more than three earned runs. Uh, and at this point in the season, given you know some developments and injuries and all this other stuff, the Dodgers are going to go as far as Walker Buehler takes them. Uh, he is the best pitcher on this on this staff uh, in terms of current day versions. Obviously, Kershaw is going to take the cake overall. Uh, but right now, it's it's Bueller's team, it's Bueller's staff, uh, and they'll go as far as he takes them because he is he is their sea biscuit, he is their secretariat. He will ride. We will ride him until the wheels fall off. Yeah, I'm definitely in uh, agreement with you guys on that. I think it's been interesting for for some of the season. Bueller didn't really look like the Bueller that we know with a lot of strikeouts. He wasn't dominant really, but he was still very effective. But the last two starts, he's been his strikeout numbers have been much more kind of where we're used to and he's been using a lot more of his pitches 
especially that new changeup that he's developed. So I'm really kind of impressed with what I've been seeing. And I think he's only going to get better as the season goes on. Yeah, you just mentioned the changeup, which has been a really exciting arsenal to already a great selection of pitches he has. Throwing a 91, 92 mile per hour changeup, you don't see that too often from a pitcher. And I said it back when the season was was in its early development and people had some concerns about Bueller's low carry. I said, he's going to get better as the season progresses. And that's exactly what he does. The guy just mentally knows, like, it's a long haul. You don't have to lay it off there in April and May. And Bueller is only getting better. So let's see what the second half brings. I'm very excited to just see what Bueller is going to do for the staff. But we have a question from Don't Look at Angie. Have the Giants turned back into pumpkins? Um, no, not yet. Uh, I think that transformation will happen probably around game 100 is what I've been telling everybody up here. I live in the Bay area, so they're all giants fans. Uh, I've been saying that they're going to fall, fall apart around game hundred. Uh, but no, I think the Dodgers are just the better team and they, they played like it. Uh, we saw that in the, uh, previous series where the Dodgers swept the giants. Uh, so in terms of have they, completely fallen off no they're still going to win they're still going to get production from these guys who aren't pr producing because that's just what the giants do uh, you can make an argument that all three of their world series titles were somewhat fluky because they got guys like travis ishikawa and all these nobodies kind of just producing when they shouldn't be uh that's just what that organization does the, the dodgers beat the giants best pitchers disclafani and gosman uh we didn't destroy gosman but we did enough damage on him uh and we were hitting the ball really hard and i think a lot of the a lot of the jams that he escaped were kind of by luck uh the fact that balls were just being hit really hard at guys and, and the talk man just highway and, robbery out of nowhere out of nowhere always Always. I, I, when I saw him in right field, I almost was like, wait a second. He's supposed to be in left field doing this to us. Why is he doing in right field now? Um, but no, I think that's a really good sign uh, moving forward. If we, if we have to face them down the stretch, we know we can beat the, the best options that they have out there. The other guys that they have, uh, Johnny Cueto, who's kind of coming back from an injury, and, and we know we can beat Alex Wood. Yeah, I was kind of agreeing with what both of you guys are saying. I was surprised. Um, I was kind of expecting to split the series, win the game against Disclafani, but lose to Gosman because that's we've had a lot of trouble with Gosman in the past. But I was really impressed with what they were doing the other day. They weren't they were really laying off the splitter. Gosman didn't have very good stuff, but we didn't get ourselves out, which I was really happy to see. And I agree with what Dave was saying earlier about um, the Giants are kind of going to fall off. They just don't have in a, in a weak division. I can see them kind of getting by in one of the central divisions with kind of the no names who are you know being affected baseball players. But in a division with two teams like the Dodgers and Padres who are just loaded with stars. They're not going to finish higher than third, I don't think. I just don't see it happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the biggest turning point in last night's ball game was Chris Taylor coming through with the bases loaded in two outs. Because if he doesn't come through with that double, I don't know if the Dodgers have the momentum in that game. So he's only proving his all star candidacy even more. And that was clutch hitting by CT3. So I want to talk about Max Muncie. Who wants to take the reins on just what Max Muncie's been doing to the Giants all season long? <laughs> I could take this one because I, I did a little bit of research on this. Muncie has now hit seven home runs in eight starts against the Giants this season. That is insane. He also has 15 career home runs against the Giants, which is just one shy of the most he's hit against a single team. Do you guys know what that team is? The most home runs he's hit against one team. And it's not the Giants, which I thought it was. Muncie? I think I saw this, but I think it was it was um, Colorado, right? Yep, the yeah. Colorado Rockies. Uh, another well, that's just a sad organization. So it doesn't it doesn't surprise me. But um, in his last seven games, which is you know when he came off the IL, uh, he's been hitting two sixty one, four fourteen on base percentage. We know we expect that from him with three home runs and five RBIs and six walks. Uh, right now, he is uh, first in the national league and on base percentage second in major league baseball at 418. He leads the national league with walks with 52 and he's seventh in major league baseball and OPS at 973. If this doesn't net him a starting role in the all-star game, I don't know what will it is a travesty. If he doesn't make it. It's been, it was interesting because he was blowing out Freeman by quite a, quite a lot in the first round. And then I don't know what happened. I guess other fans rallied this. I thought I've seen some, some rumors about some, fans of other teams voting for Freeman to keep Muncie off the board. And I, you know, I just think it shows kind of the flaws with fan voting because Muncie's numbers are 
his OPS is almost 100, I think at least 100 points higher than Freeman. I mean, I know Freeman's been hitting some bad luck, but once he's just been like, I mean, he's an MVP candidate. I mean, there's no way that you can logically tell me why he doesn't deserve to start that game. Yeah, there, there is no explanation. Uh, the, the way they've done this voting system it is ridiculous. Uh, he's probably not going to be the starter because, like you guys said, teams are just hate the Dodgers and they want to vote for Freddie Freeman, even though there's – I don't think there's one metric that justifies uh, this, especially after last night where Muncie uh, tied him in home runs, I believe. He's 10th in baseball in war. There's a 19 – this is the craziest stat to me. There's a 19% chance he's going to walk when he steps into the batter's box. That's, like, ridiculous. Uh, it's – I don't know. I mean, he's having one of the best seasons we've seen it for him, from a first half Dodger since Bellinger's MVP season for sure. And he spent time on the IL and hasn't yeah. missed a step. Yeah, he missed ten games and still leads baseball in walks. Yeah, I think I saw his. Uh, I think his WAR was around four and a half, and Freeman's was about one. So it's just like the level of yeah, in, not uh, knowing that how much player Muncy is just like it's something that doesn't really matter. This this bothers me. Obviously, Muncy will be at the game, but it's really. He should, he should be starting, and he should he deserves that recognition. Yeah, yep. 100%. The biggest redemption story in Major League Baseball also takes place in Hollywood, and that story belongs to Kenley Jansen, who had back-to-back -back saves against the San Francisco Giants. He's improved his season ERA to 138, another potential all-star. He should be a lock. I hope they put him in there. In the month of June, he had eight saves. He gave up zero earned runs and he pitched 10.1 innings. Whatever Jansen's done, he's turned back the clock and he's turned and he's converted back into the elite closer that we once knew him as. Yeah, I think, I think I, I'm glad that, that Sam is, is on the show for, for this, for what I'm about to say, because um, I know that, that Sam is a huge Kenley Jansen fan, been, been one for a while. Yeah. Um, but at the beginning of the season, I just thought that he was not a high leverage reliever anymore and he just wasn't elite. And in my defense, just based on what happened in the 2020 playoffs and world series, it, it kind of made sense that, you know, Roberts knew that he couldn't go to Jansen in, in that spot with, uh, with Urias cooking as, as well as he was cooking in, in game six. Um, and, and that was sort of, it was sort of telling that they couldn't really rely on him. Jansen has figured it out in the off season. He, he changed his workout regimen. He's done a lot more cardio and a lot less weightlifting and, and whatever, but he's been consistently throwing in the upper nineties, 96, 97. The cutter is moving like no one's business, the curveball or the slider or whatever it is. It yeah. is just devastating. Um, unhittable. Um, he's really turned it around. I will I gladly eat my words on this one. I, every time I, I make a, a bad comment about, about any one of the Dodgers players. I hope that eventually they do prove me wrong looking at you, AJ Pollock. Like I'm hoping <laughs> that he, he turns into an MVP candidate at some point, because that means that the Dodgers are doing well and, and we're relying on Kenley Jansen and he has come through on many, many occasions, little shaky on the back to back, but he was able to pull it off. Yeah. I think kind of what we saw last night kind of shows the difference between Jansen now and Jansen a few years ago, obviously he's improved his velocity, but he's also improved the way that he selects his pitches, like his cutter last night, he just didn't have it. He didn't have command for it. It wasn't moving as much. And he just kind of, he, you know, he let the first two guys get on, and then he just stopped throwing it through the, uh, the two seamer, the sinker, that other fastball that he has in the slider. And you can see how, how effective he was with it. And the way you saw him pumped up at the end, I think that was a big game for him to see that he didn't have his best stuff, that Robert stressed him to go out and get it, and that he knew he could go out and get it without having to rely on his cutter as he has in the past. Because obviously while he throws the, um, the sinker, He's regained velocity on that. The cutter isn't quite where it was. So you can see that um, without command of it, it can be dicey. So I think that's kind of the difference between Jansen this year and last year is that he has those other pitches and he'll rely on them. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a great point to make because last year we kind of saw him be stubborn about the cutter. Uh, and back in 2017, 2016, everything before that, he could get by with just throwing the cutter because it was that good. The velocity was there. It was always going to cut and he didn't have to do anything else. And after last season, I think he took a hard look in the mirror and said, look, uh, I'm going to have to adjust at some point. So it might as well be now uh, I'm in a contract year. I got to adjust period. And he's done a tremendous job of that. Uh, he's mixed in the other pitches. He's, he's 
been responsive to obviously the Dodgers, you know, training staff or whoever he's working with in the off season to, to switch up his routine and do a little less weightlifting, a little bit more conditioning. Uh, but I mean, he's been electric. He's an all-star for sure. I don't care if he gets in, he should get in. He is an all-star regardless. Uh, didn't give up a run in June. His last blown save was May 5th in Chicago. And that was an extra inning game where the runner started on second base. Uh, he's been, he's been lights out and this Dodgers bullpen is starting to take shape outside of Jansen too. We have about five or six reliable options at this point, which is a lot better than it was a month ago. Yeah. We're going to talk about one in just a second, but I just want to round out the Jansen thoughts with so far, he has a higher war wins above replacement over Christian Yelich, John Carlos Stanton and Anthony Rendon. And he's tied with Bryce Harper. So just think about how much money those guys make. And here we have a closer who is more valuable than all those one-time superstars and some MVPs. So that's just awesome for Jansen right there. Joe Kelly, or Joseph Kelly, as they're calling him now. Another story. I did not see this one coming. In the month, of, or correction, over his last seven innings pitched, one hit allowed, seven strikeouts, zero earned runs. Did we get Joe Kelly from 2018? I, think I mean, so. I think we just got a healthy Joe Kelly, and I don't think we've had a healthy Joe Kelly since he's been a Dodger. Uh, I mean, last year was – he didn't know where the fucking ball was going to go. Uh, I mean, he would throw the pitch and just hopefully it was going to go in the strike zone, but he had no clue. Uh, and this year, he's he's been throwing strikes. Obviously, he had his one one or two blips where he, he first came back from, the, from his injury, and they, they didn't send him on a rehab assignment, so it was just kind of a weird first couple of outings or whatever. Uh, but like you said, the command is there. He, I mean, he's walked two guys in his last 11 innings. Joe Kelly has walked two guys in his last 11 innings. So the answer to your question would be yes for me. I also think that he's, he's just meeting the moment. I mean, he's, he's playing up to his potential. And I think that that it goes across the board with this Dodgers bullpen. I mean, you look at what we had not only last year, but the beginning of this year, Gratterall last year, who was great, and this year has been non-existent because he just just hasn't does hasn't had it, and he was injured as well. Um, Corey Knable went down with a just an awful injury. It's question up in the air if he's coming back at all, and if he does come back, how effective will he be? You've had a lot of guys just step up in their in their roles. Jansen being one of them. You look at Joe Kelly. Um, and you look at the rest of the guys like Bickford came out of nowhere. He's become a high leverage reliever. Um, and, and they're just stepping up and this bullpen has just been locked down. You've seen, um, the, where there were multiple instances in those two games with the giants alone. And even, and even with the Cubs too, where it could have gone South, like it could have just been an absolute disaster. And these guys found something within themselves and got the job done. So it's just an amazing job by this bullpen, especially they're asked to, you know, not only keep these slim leads because maybe the offense doesn't have it that night. Jansen made that comment about picking up the offense, but also dominating in these bullpen games. I mean, I hate these bullpen games, but they've been doing really well in them. Yeah, I think, um, I think the stuff with the bullpen is best evidenced by the game where Bellinger with the walk-off home run and they took, they pulled a Rios pretty early. And I think if that had been a game we played in May, I don't think there's a chance to win that game just because of the guys we have in the bullpen. But the fact that Kelly and Bickford between them covered about five innings, thanks to Bickford's like three pitch inning. And they were really effective. Didn't give up. I don't think they gave up even any hits. I think the level of them being able to do that changes so much and probably gets us throughout the season, like four or five just extra wins just between the two of them. They've been tr tremendous. I think we saw, we saw a little bit of this from Kelly in the second half of 2019 when he was, when he was healthy for a little bit, but we didn't see it, you know, 101 the corner and a really he incorporated a really nasty changeup, which I think has been helping kind of keep hitters off balance from just sitting on the fast fella curve ball. Right. Yeah, and just we haven't really talked about this Padres series a lot. I just want to say one thing. Um we had Muncie for for one, I want to say maybe two games in that series. He had just returned from the disabled list and and Bellinger for one as well who just returned. So these guys, you know, weren't fully back yet. So I again I mean, I've said this online, but I, I really wouldn't look into that sweep too much. I, I just wouldn't. Um, the Padres are a very legit team, no doubt. Uh, but they, the Dodgers still haven't played them at full strength. Not once this entire season. Uh, so let's, let's pump the brakes on the panic 
Uh, I think this will be a two team, two team race uh, at the end. I think it's going to be the Dodgers and the Padres with the giants, maybe sneaking in as a wild card team. Uh, but look, the Dodgers don't play the Padres again until the end of, uh, I want to say August, I think it is. Uh, and they should be, they should be full go at that point, given some other situations, but full go offensively. Yeah, right on. Well, a month ago I said, you know, June's going to be the Dodgers month. I had a really good feeling that the Dodgers would turn things around and despite being swept by the Padres and despite a Mickey mouse, no hitter by the Cubs, they managed, <laughs> they managed to go 17 and nine, which is a success in my book, especially coming off that sweep of the giants. Um, you know, some weird things though, the offense did kind of struggle. They only batted 229 as a team, but the pitching was there tied for second with a 317 team ERA. Justin Turner was a star the entire month. He batted 317 with a 429 on base and a 916 OPS. And Mookie Betts, despite, you know, the still low batting average, managed to put up an 864 OPS and had five home runs himself. Yeah, and to that point about Mookie Betts, he he has been doing well, but but we're, we're so accustomed and used to him doing things out of this world uh, uh, to the level that we're seeing from Fernando Tatis Jr. and Ronald, Ronald Acuna Jr. and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. Um, we're, we're expecting those kind of offensive numbers to happen. And the one thing that I'm sort of waiting for is for him to put together a few games. It just seems like there is one game on, one game off type of deal. And I found it interesting that he has 10 home runs this year. All of them are solo shots. Um, and so that to me is, is a little concerning because it, it feels like while he, while he is getting the ball and knocking the ball out of the park and he has had a few leadoff home runs, there are situations where he comes up in late in the game where you get the bases loaded or you got, you know, runners on second and third. And, and, and he tends to, you know, swing at the first pitch and pop it up. Um, and those are balls that he, that he could easily crush that he has crushed uh, throughout his career. So that's what I'm waiting for on him is, is for him to put together a few games because he is the catalyst and you know, he was the reason why we were able to win the world series last year. He pushed us over the edge. And so just waiting for that to happen at some point, I think it will. Yeah, I, to- I totally agree. It seems though there'll be in one day he'll go, he'll hit a home run, he'll hit a, like a double and I'll hit a walk in the next game. It's a ground ball, the third base, a pop up to right the strikeout. Like we just haven't seen that consistency that we saw last year. And he hasn't been the same against like elite pitching and elite relief pitching, which is why he was so effective as a catalyst for us last year. And also with the speed and defense haven't been there quite as they were last year, which makes me wonder if he's still kind of bothered by a few lingering issues. Yeah, definitely. A few guys that struggled in the month of June, I'm going to call them out. AJ Pollock, who Jake, Jake mentioned earlier, 648 OPS. Gavin Lux really struggled in that month batted 195 with a 595 OPS and Matt Beatty hit 175 himself. Which of these guys are you least concerned about and who's going to turn the corner and have a good July? Oh, I'm, I mean, I'm, least concer- I'm least concerned about Lux out yeah. of those three. Um, I think yeah. that, that Lux, um, this is again, and, and, you know, I don't want to continue to make excuses for him or, or, or what have you, but this is his first full season and he has had to fill in for Corey Seager. And that's, you know, those are not easy shoes to fill. Um, so I, I would want to keep that in mind as we're watching Gavin Lux. There are a lot of things that I do like about him. Um, his defense has been solid. Um, I feel pretty fairly confident with him making a routine play over there. Like I said, his speed is really just out of this world. I didn't, I didn't realize how fast he was until we've gotten to get a, a good look at him this year. So give him time. He will figure it out. We've seen him go on, you know, many spurts here and there. So I'm least worried about him. Most worried about Pollock, least worried about Lux. I would kind of agree with that. I think Lux, it's tough because we've, we've seen him do it. He had such a good May. and he, We've seen him have games where he he looks like, you know, he could be turning into a star, but at the same time, he has games where he just looks completely lost. And I think if he can figure it out against lefties, he's going to be um, much kind of more likely to achieve his potential. But I think that um, ha- he's not necessarily a liability every day in the lineup because when he gets on base, you know, he can seal a base. He plays really good defense, especially at second base. I believe he was one of the best second basemen when he was playing over there. And I think I agree with kind of, and, you know, about Pollock Beatty doesn't really concern me much because he's not 
he's almost like a non-factor. Like he'll come off the bench, kind of do his job, but he won't be around probably. I think when Seager comes back, he'll get sent down. So it's not really an issue. Um, but Pollock's obviously going to be in there all year. And I think it's interesting because he was so good last year. At least he had the power and we just haven't seen any of that this year. And I don't know whether it's due to he hasn't ha- had that much playing time or the league is figuring it out. Like I, I just don't understand kind of the inconsistency, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I agree with both of you. Um, I'm not concerned about AJ Pollock because my ex- expectations of AJ Pollock are not high at all. Uh, it's, you know, anything we get out of him will, will be a bonus. Uh, and we, we did get that home run uh, against, I was it Chicago, I think. Yeah, it was Chicago uh, who basically got us that win. So he's going to hit a couple of those home runs. Uh, the question is, I, I don't understand why he starts against right-handed pitchers when McKinstry is yeah. alive. Um, he yeah, and Zach McKinstry is in fact breathing and alive and healthy, uh, and just hit a grand slam. And, and we still somehow started Pollock against a righty, uh, the day after that. So that's my concern. Uh, Gavin Lux is going to figure it out. He's 22 years old. He has issues hitting left-handed pitching. That is, that is a fact. Uh, yeah. uh, but he's more than competent against righties. The speed is a game changer. The defense is a game changer. And in terms of filling in for Corey Seager, he's exceeded my expectations. He's done his job and, and then some. Yeah, I think was one more thing on Lux. I think I realize is Bellinger in 2018 really, really struggled against lefties. He got a cha- and he got um, almost, I think he got platooned and was took that, not personally, but, you know, he took it to heart to kind of improve against that over the offseason, and he did. And then he, was, he hit more home runs. 2019 yeah. than, any, than yeah. anyone off lefty. So I think it shows how young players can struggle like that and kind of then, then figure it out. Yeah, and these, these professional baseball teams and pitchers who've been in the league for 10 years are going to go after are going to go after you if you can't, you know, if they know you can't hit lefties, uh, they're going to attack those weak spots. They're going to they're going to send out, they're going to bring in a lefty late in the game to face you uh, and et cetera. They're going to they know the holes in your strike zone. Like we said, though, he's 22. He's going to figure it out. Yeah, definitely. I'm actually not concerned with either player. I think they're both going to have good Julys, so we'll see what happens. Uh, on the Corey Seager front, he has been transferred to the 60-day IL, but no need to panic. It's going to be another two or three weeks. His hand is not properly recovering like they had hoped to that fracture he suffered, but we should see him back after the All-Star break, and I think that's reasonable to expect. In the meantime, the Dodgers added a right-handed pitcher, Bobby Wall, the 29-year-old who has a career ERA of 763. Don't know too much about him, but he throws right-handed. So we'll see if he has an impact. Otherwise, Friedman just moving parts. Yeah, that's the key phrase, right? Don't know much about him, which means he's going to be elite. But we have the last, well, the last right, the last righty we got from uh, Milwaukee, Phil Bickford turned out to be really good. So <laughs> we'll see if we get something similar from this guy. Zimzy, our friend on Twitter, wants to know. Has this year shown that the Dodgers can let Corey Seager walk in free agency? It's a very tough question. I don't want to answer this one first. Sam? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I mean, it depends kind of on some other issues with the payroll. I don't know if we're, we're going to talk about Bauer, but whether or not we're going to be paying his salary, I think mm-hmm. factors into whether or not we're going to pay Seager. I think it shows that the team is still like, good without him they can function without him but i think we're gonna notice his absence when we watch him in the lineup in a few months so i think it, it'd be really it'd be it'd be tough it'd be tough to lose him. i still think it's it's a little extra security in case we do but i don't yeah. think it, it's any sort of making any sort of case that um we can we can just kind of let him walk so to speak yeah i was thinking about this last night and you know ross detweiler really ruined what Corey seager's perfect season could have been he was at one point projected to get a 10 year contract. Now I'm starting to think maybe Corey Seager takes a one year deal with the Dodgers at a high, a, a high AAV and bets on himself for the 2022 season goes back into free agency, gets a bigger contract that he might, then he might be getting right now because we don't know what teams are willing to pay him because they don't have a good sample size to go off of. I like, I like your optimism. Uh, but Scott Boris would fire himself before he lets him do that. Uh, that's just not going to happen. Uh, but in terms of the question, it's tricky uh, because you got four, four or five other free agent shortstops who are pretty damn elite. Uh, you got Trevor Story. You got Carlos Correa, who won't be a Dodger in my opinion. 
you got uh, Baez. Baez and Trey Turner. Uh, so these guys are, you know, the Dodgers are going to take a look at all of these guys. They, they definitely are. I think they're encouraged what they saw from Lux, uh, but that's not going to stop them from exploring these other avenues. Uh, and then you got, you know, Kershaw coming off the books and Kenley Jansen coming off the books, who prior to this season, uh, fans were rejoicing that Kenley Jansen was coming off the books with his $20 million salary. Uh, but now you fast forward to now and it's like, well, hold on a minute. Like maybe, maybe we should bring back Kenley Jansen because uh, he's going to have suitors. Uh, I think the Philadelphia Phillies would salivate at the chance to sign Kenley Jansen right now. And there's going to be other teams there as well. So it's going to be a tricky situation financially. And then we got some other X factors too, but uh, I don't know. I, I really don't know how this is going to shape out. It's going to be an interesting uh, off season financially for the Dodgers. Yeah. I think this off season is really going to be one that shapes the next, not five years of the team, maybe three years in like both financially and kind of structure and chemistry. Cause there are a lot of key guys like um, Chris Taylor also was coming off the books. He's yeah. a guy that you're going to need, probably need to try to keep around if you can kind of give him a competitive salary. Um, and like Taylor, Kershaw, Jansen, so you're all like have been key components of kind of this run. And I think it'd be very weird to see the team without um, most of them, even if it frees up kind of a lot of money. I don't know, kind of, it'd be really interesting to see what direction they could take if they decide to kind of stay away from some of the guys who've been on the team for a lot, for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like Seeger. I really like, I, what, what he did in 2020 um, in the shortened season and in the playoffs is, is nothing short of just, miraculous um just coming off of what happened in 2018 tommy john uh you know had a had a rough 2019 2020 was was kind of the year um that he sort of proved that he could stay healthy for an extended period of time not a full season obviously but um i was really looking forward to seeing him test those skills this year in, in a full 162 and while the injury to him wasn't his fault and it's not, you know, as a result of him pulling a hamstring or, or, or whatever, um, it, it's still, it's still a little concerning though, when you think about, you know, do you, do you want to hit your, you know, your wagon to a guy that you don't know is going to be able to stay healthy? Um, and, and that is, and that's hard um, to, to make that commitment, especially like, you know, David mentioned all of the rest of the shortstops that are out there are pretty damn elite and they stay healthy. Well, not Correa. I think, yeah. It's, I mean, it's interesting. Okay. Because, with the exception yeah. of Correa, but he's healthy now. No, I'm sorry. Why, do, why, yeah. why even bring that up? No, I think <laughs> Correa and I think Correa and probably Baez are almost two players. Almost, there's almost no chance we sign. I think Baez would be a good fit if he didn't swing and miss so much. But I think that's something yeah. that could really scare the Dodgers. And that does not, I don't think that's a sign that he's going to age well at all, especially kind of. His only thing right now is hitting home runs, and as he ages, the defense and running is going to get worse. So I think that's not a guy you want to make a long term long term commitment to. So I think Trevor Story maybe is a possibility this year for the sign instead, especially because he's right handed. He's not having a very good season, and we're not sure about his production away from Coors. So I think Seager is almost in this class like the safest bet because you know what you're going to get from him. Yeah. Unless they're interested about... in waiting or trying to trade for Trey Turner, but I think the Nats might yeah. want to keep him. He might he might be the yeah. guy. Yeah, and yet everyone. Bags on Seager's defense. Trey Turner is not a good defender either. So I don't see how, what's the point of that? You're just, it's a horizontal move. Cause I don't think I mean, Turner's speed. I don't think his speed is sustainable. Why do you think that? I mean, look, because look, that's what happens with everyone with age. Yes. But here's the thing. You're, you're not paying for defense. You know, if you want, if you want bias, I mean, that's, that's a good defender right there, but if you're looking at someone that you want in the middle of your lineup, or at least at the top of your lineup, you want someone that could, that can stay healthy. That's literally the only, the only criteria right now, because you're not, you know, what we're not really like, you know, yes, Seeger's not a great fielding shortstop, but if he produces at the plate, no one really cares. Yep. That's my mentality. I, I, I care. Mean, yeah. I personally care. I don't care. Uh, if, Derek if they Jeter, sign Derek Jeter was fine. If they sign Seager, I don't think he, they're signing him as a shortstop. I really don't. Uh, well, I think that's my a, whole point yeah. is that he's that they're, they're signing him for his bat. The only the only question is can he stay healthy? And if the if the National League gets a DH, which probably will happen, then that 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 solves your problem right there. I agree. I, I think Seager at shortstop is a is an absolute nightmare. Um, and his fundamentals are just completely off and, and, and it's an adventure over there every time. And he's, 
And he's given up some, I mean, I don't know what his, his defensive run saved is, but like there have been multiple situations where he's, he's let runs come across the plate because of his defense. Yeah. yeah I think I, I, I agree with all that. I think also, I think if we do have a, I think we will have a DH whenever, hopefully there's not like a lockout or anything, whatever the next season starts, there will be a DH, I believe. Um, and that'll also be good for Seager. I think Turner will probably do it for the remainder of his contract, which Seager will be fine short for another one or two seasons. And then as soon as Seager's in the DH spot, he's also way less likely to get hurt because he'll be on the field a lot less. Yeah. Because we get the bat without some of the injury risk and the bad fielding. And I do want to give him a little credit for the fielding. It's not good. It was He carried it in the 2020 postseason. I remember we were pretty worried about that coming in. He's very smooth over there at short during the postseason. So. He was. We've yeah. seen that he can't have. I think the, he's very streaky. There'll be the postseason. He's never terrible. cost them with his defense. Yeah. Cool. All right. I didn't really get to share my thoughts on Corey Seager, but as many people know, I'm a huge Seager believer. I've been backing this guy since day one, and I don't think the Dodgers are ready to just let this guy walk in free agency. You know, Andrew Freeman's a very calculated man, and I think they value the Dodger or they value Corey Seager's bat in that Dodgers lineup just about as high as anyone else in, the, in that team. So it's just a wait and see what Corey Seager is going to do in the second half. Cause if he has a big second half and has another historic postseason run, I don't know how you let him walk, but we're going to move on. Some developments have shaken the Dodgers community and it's, <laughs> it's involving Dodgers highest paid pitcher, Trevor Bauer. We're not going to really dive too deep into what our personal thoughts are but we're going to give you the gist and just the scoop of what's going on uh, at the moment, the athletic as well as uh, TMZ broke that Trevor Bauer has been alleged assault by a female. Uh, they had a couple sexual encounters. We heard her side of the story. We're still kind of waiting on what Trevor Bauer side of the story is, but you know, we won't dive into who's innocent and who's guilty, but we will talk about how this might affect the Dodgers because in the short scheme of things, I would expect that Bauer is going to be out indefinitely for maybe a short period amount of time. So I wanted to get your guys' thoughts on maybe like how this affects the Dodgers and just go from there. Guess based on how um, other suspensions or uh, – However, uh, Major League Baseball has dealt with these issues in the past. Um, but the Dodgers did come out with a statement saying that they were aware of the allegations and are essentially deferring to Major League Baseball to try and uh, have them handle it, uh, you know, if there is to be any disciplinary actions. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a wait and see. Uh, certainly, um, you know, reading the details is, is, is kind of uh, – it's hard to really – you know, give your opinion at this point, just because the responsible thing to do is, is to just wait and see until all the facts are out. And then once the Dodgers or major league baseball makes a decision on what they're going to do, I think at that point we can just, we can kind of discuss it of what we think should happen in, in, in terms of the roster uh, and, and what happens to Trevor Bauer's slot. If that slot goes away. Yeah, I mean, it's a very unfortunate situation for primarily the victim, obviously, uh, and for everyone involved. Uh, obviously, we don't know the facts. I'm not going to get into what I think because I, I don't know anything about what happened. I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know anything. Uh, but I would, I would imagine we're not going to see Trevor Bauer for a long time uh, or maybe ever again in a Dodgers uniform. Uh, again, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, obviously more is going to take shape in the coming weeks, probably. Uh, but if I had to take a guess, I don't think he's going to pitch Sunday. Yeah, I'd be, I think a lot of people were surprised to even see him in the clubhouse yesterday and celebrating with the team on the field after the win. I think, especially with the article in the athletic that came out today, I think maybe he'll be with the team. I, I, I don't really know how they're going to handle this but i think um you know the dodgers are an organization that always kind of does the right thing when it comes to issues like this or a very kind of humanitarian organization so i trust them to handle it well and on the baseball side of things though i agree that bauer probably will not be making a start anytime soon if it's going to be kind of out indefinitely or more than kind of a few t turns for the rotation they're going to need to look at replacing um his production certainly they're going to need to look yeah. at trading for somebody yeah i mean this is a perfect 
not the way we hoped, but this will definitely answer Billy Brown's question on Twitter. Trade deadline talk. Do the Dodgers need to acquire a starting pitcher or are there other players, positional way, positional player wise or relief pitchers that we're eyeing? You know, I said this before the Bauer incident that they needed a contingency plan and they need to still acquire a backup starter. And my stance on that hasn't changed. Now, if we lose Bauer indefinitely, I think I want to up the ante and go after Luis Castillo. Now, he hasn't had the greatest season with the Cincinnati Reds, but the Reds really aren't going anywhere. And we know Castillo has the potential to be a great pitcher. And I have full faith in Mark Pryor, who's really turned the career around of a lot of guys already, that he could do the same with Luis Castillo, who's known for having a nasty changeup, a hard fastball, as well as other great breaking ball pitches. So I'm kind of looking that way now and, you know, get like a strong three or number four guy. And I like Castillo. I've been saying Kendall Graveman in the bullpen. I still think we need one more good arm. Uh, I'm not too sold on David Price these days. I think we could also go the strong lefty route. I know Victor Gonzalez's control has been really wonky lately, uh, struggling with the command, a lot of walks, a higher whip. So I don't know which reliever left-handed wise we go after. I know Richard Rodriguez is a popular name, but I'm sure the Pirates have a high bargaining price on that guy. The one thing I will say is that, and, and again, no way for the for the Dodgers to really foresee the developments with Bauer and, and, and all of that. However, they were playing with fire with four starters for a long time. And so, you know, even if Bauer is, is out indefinitely, that sort of, you can kind of equate that to someone being out with an injury, right? I mean, that, that's something that they needed to address. And I, I thought that, you know, the way that they handled it and in sort of when once Dustin May went down, I just felt like they needed to bring in some reinforcements. And, and for my, for my liking, I think Tony Gonsolin came in a little bit too late for us and we're seeing, you know, kind of him trying to get his, uh, his legs underneath him again. And he's struggled a little bit, although in his last outing, he looked a little bit better, a little bit better command. Um, so still, we still have He still hasn't been stretched out yet. So we don't know how long he can go in deep into games, but yeah, I think even with, without um, the, the developments with Bauer, the Dodgers needed to need to get a starter regardless. And it now, now it looks like they need to get a, you know, more, uh, you know, more of an elite starter. Uh, maybe, maybe they, you know, kick the tires on Max Scherzer or some, someone, you know, higher up, higher uh, echelon than, than just Luis Castillo. I love the idea of trying to go after Max Scherzer. I know the Nationals are, have been playing well recently, but I don't expect that to last definitely until the postseason, hopefully not for another month. So we'll consider trading Scherzer. I saw the other day that Scherzer said he wouldn't waive his no trade clause or something like that if he couldn't get an extension with the team. But again, if we don't have, if the Dodgers won't be paying Bauer's salary, that kind of is less of an obstacle with maybe paying Scherzer in the future. But I, I just think you need, Bauer is like a superstar caliber pitcher. And I think you need to replace that with another superstar caliber pitcher if you can, or at least do anything you can to do that. I'm, I think building a package around Ruiz could be a good idea because obviously catching is scarce and we have um, Cartaya as well in, in the minors and Smith obviously raking at the major league level. So I think um, he's definitely somebody we can float around trade deadline to try and find. Um, Scherzer Castillo also would be a great option. Maybe Jose um, Barreos of the Twins is another good option for somebody who kind of got this stuff and not necessarily hasn't been able to put it together. So I think we could definitely do some, do some stuff with. Here's my, uh, here's my, I'm going to throw this, throw this scenario out there. Go after Nick Castellanos and get him to bring Wade Miley with him. Uh, obviously Wade, Wade Miley. Miley, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's not what I thought you were going to say. I know, I know. Obviously, Castillo would be a nice addition in that trade too. But Castellanos, one, is going to be extremely expensive uh, to acquire. Uh, he's on a, a pretty hefty contract, which you know will help the Dodgers in negotiations per se. Uh, but look, I, I still think if they're gonna if they're gonna lose Bauer, uh, which if these allegations are true, I hope they do. Uh, I think the way you go is you just you just offense teams to death. Uh, I don't think acquiring Scherzer is going to be possible. And after that, there's not a whole lot of like shut down guys left. So why not go get Castellanos, stick him in left field uh, and just score five to six, to seven to eight runs a game and just rely on the offense, rely on Bueller, Kershaw, Arias and the back end of the bullpen to win games. I think having 
Cassie Hudson in the lineup, obviously is a, a huge boost. I agree that I would have wanted them to go on the field anyways, but I think especially they do need a right-handed bat. If they're going to lose a little bit in pitching, you want to gain more than you were thinking initially in offense. Could be good idea. And just imagine having him sitting between Seager and Bellinger and Muncie and Bellinger. Just like, yeah. yeah. Although you, you can't bring in a relief pitcher that's going to get all three of them out effectively. I think he would really balance out the lineup well with Turner and Smith and Castellanos as righties to Bellinger, Seager, and Muncie as lefties. Yeah, I mean, that would be my number one target uh, regardless. I think he does everything that the Dodgers love. Uh, I mean, he's, you know, not amazing in left field, uh, but he's, he's basically what AJ Pollock, what they wanted AJ Pollock to be. Yeah. Yeah, that's definitely a bat that I've wanted for years. The contracts does concern me. I don't know if the Dodgers are willing to take on all that salary, but his offense definitely validates what they're, what the Reds are currently paying for him. So it would be a huge boost. Definitely no doubt about it. And also just to, to touch, to kind of respond to what David said, I think it, I think it could work, uh, you know, building up your offense and just, you know, outscoring everybody to death. I just worry about the bullpen. I, I just worry because we're already doing, we already have sort of the bullpen uh, game set up when Gonsolin pitches. And if we lose Bauer, um, we just, even if we don't, even if we don't get like an elite starting pitcher, we need some starters. Uh, we need yeah. guys that can go out there and get us five innings because right. otherwise this bullpen is just going to be dead by the postseason. Yeah, I think yeah, Kyle exactly. Gibson could be a good option. Wade yeah. Miley's not a bad option for that either. Kyle Gibson's good. And Josiah Gray is coming back from an injury. He's making a lot of progress. We could be someone we see come up um, maybe in August or late July to kind of just eat some innings and kind of get, get his feet wet. Oh, I'd love to see Josiah Gray. I didn't know he was he was close or he was yeah, I think I saw he was he was starting to throw to hitters. Yeah, I saw so, that. Making progress. Well, yeah, I mean they definitely need they definitely need someone for sure. Uh, and hopefully Gonsolin can be that guy too. Uh, I mean, he looked good, uh, but they, they need to get him up to 100 pitches. Yeah. This one's kind of geared towards Jake. Gorilla Golf wants to know, why don't players bunt against the shift? And he's talking about the Dodgers. Why aren't they bunting against the shift or hitting against the shift more? Just not – it's just not what they do. I mean, it's not what they do anymore in Major League Baseball. They don't do small ball. And, you know, for, for guys, you know, it's it, it's hard to bunt. I mean, if you think about the guys that throw like 97 to 102 miles an hour with, with movement, to try and bunt a ball like that is, is fairly difficult. And, and I don't think that the position players really practice it much. We know pitchers do in the National League, but the position players don't really don't really practice it that much. Personally, I would like to see it. I, I think that um, the the Dodger they they shift on the Dodgers. Well, they shift on everybody, but I, I just feel like a lot of the times the Dodgers um, get burned by the shift. We saw that time and time again in that San Diego series where you had uh, uh, Matt Beatty and Max Muncie just hitting into uh, the shift to the short right fielder Manny Machado. I mean, that was just just brutal to watch every time because they would crush these balls and they would have like a you know, a 900 expected batting average and they would get caught. So yeah, I would like to see it for sure. I don't know why they, why they don't do it per se, but, uh, but my guess is that they just feel like the, the percentages are a lot higher if they just try to hit the ball. Yeah. Analytics is the answer to that question. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's true. Um, how about this question from uh, one of our loyal fans out there, Josh, the flip on Twitter. Do you think we'll see Cabot Ruiz before the playoffs? The problem with that one is he has one option left. So if they're going to call him up, they got to make sure like if they call him up again, like he, he's not going to go back down. I think that's where it gets a little hairy. Yeah, I think, I think we'll, I think we'll see him because I, hopefully no one gets hurt, but obviously that's never, that's never a given. Um, and I think Barnes's value is going down as Smith becomes a better framer and defensive catcher. I think we saw the first game against the Giants, there was Smith made a few picks that were, I mean, incredible. Just definitely run saving, especially when Trinan was pitching that inning. And I think um, his framing has also been not barely worse than Barnes's. So I think that um, at some point we might see a situation like we did in, um, in 2019 where Barnes got sent down and kind of then came back in September. I'm not sure what we'll see with that, but I think Ruiz is going to be, He's tearing it up too much at AAA to stay out of the lineup, I think, all year. Yeah, I think it comes down to 
how the rest of the team is playing. Uh, I think if the offense is, is struggling and uh, specifically Barnes, I think they will bring him up because we've seen Will now, we've seen Will Smith now uh, catch Kershaw a lot more. Uh, he's catching all the pitchers a lot more. And he's a, he's a top three defensive catcher in baseball by these rankings, uh, by, by framing, by uh, all these other, you know, weird, obscure catching metrics that I don't necessarily believe in, but are there. Uh, so he, he's got it. He, he's, he's, the, he's the catcher. Uh, and Barnes' use uh, is, simply not, is simply not there anymore. It's just not. Kevin. I, wouldn't go, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, Kershaw just had a 13 strikeout game throwing up Austin Barnes. So there's definitely. I'm not some... saying he Kershaw. can't be useful, but uh, if you, if you a... need offense, if you need offense, you, you got to give Kyber a shot. Well, right. And I think, I think obviously Kershaw is probably more comfortable. I think Barnes is still a better defensive hit than Smith, but the margins, it, it's so, it's coming so marginal that the offense, the offense is different, doesn't make it worth it. Yeah, obviously, Kershaw, Barnes is. They're very comfortable together, but we've seen Kershaw dominate with Smith. I mean, they're going to need to learn to be able to work together effectively anyway, so you might as well kind of get going with that. I think Barnes is probably one of the top defensive, especially backup catchers in the league, but with Ruiz's offense, it's just not justifiable to keep him up there for much longer. Well, Barnes did have two ninth-inning home runs this season. He took the fraud, Mark Melanson deep. He also did some damage against Josh Hader. We know he can come through in the clutch. It's just a matter of, I agree with David, if the Dodgers are pressing and need to get some wins with the offense, then yeah, you roll the dice with Ruiz. But for right now, I feel like we're not obligated to necessarily call up Ruiz. And I'm a huge believer in him. I think he's going to be a legitimate star catcher. We don't need to rush him up if we don't have to. So let him continue. He does have one more option year left. So they can call him up as much as they want and send him down this year. Uh, So it's, if they call him up again, they don't have to keep him there. They can, they can, you know, it's, it's a revolving door with these option years. So he has one more year left. Right. Right. As we were talking about earlier, actually just kind of came to my mind. They might try to bring him up for a preview if they're trying to think about trading him and kind of give him a shot to show what he's got at the major league level to kind of see if other teams want to scout him or be interested, especially if we're looking at an elite starting pitcher. He'd probably be the, the, the guy they're going to make a deal around with Cartaya kind of as reissue, as uh, insurance. Yeah. Yeah. Matt Weiner of Dodgers tailgate. Wants to know our thoughts on Cody Bellinger batting second. Now, I know he batted second recently, and I think that was the game where he hit the walk-off home run, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. That was the only time we see, we've seen it this season. You know, I don't think it's going to be a thing. You know, I think Max Muncy has really served as a good number two hitter while Corey Seager is out. But I also do like Cody Bellinger in that spot if needed, if Muncy is out that game, because I just love Bellinger's ability to draw walks and his high on base ability. That's one thing that I've noticed from Bellinger coming back from the IL is that he's been so much more selective than I've ever seen him in his career. He's just working the count and he's kind of just doing the whole um, Max Muncy thing, uh, which is just wait for your pitch. And when you get it, do damage. And the other advantage to having him hit second sometimes is his speed. He gets on base. He can steal a bag. He can also score from first easily on a double. So it does, it does work. And, and also uh, percentage wise, if he's batting second, he's going to get likely more at bats per game. But honestly, I think Dave Roberts likes him batting fourth. I'm fine with that. You know, he's, he's, he's been producing since he's come back from the IL and it's, and it's pretty remarkable not to mention the upgrade defensively. I know we've talked about it time and time again, but just his, ability to cover the outfield and center field not only is he a great defender out there but if you have bellinger in center then you have mookie in right and mookie's an elite defender in right field with bellinger out you had to move mookie to center or you had to move chris taylor to center and then you had you know matt Beatty out there in right field and mckinstry out there in right field and those guys just are nowhere as good so having bellinger in center field again makes all the difference in the world yeah. yeah, in terms of hitting second, I think it should be, assuming Betts is hitting first and Turner's hitting third, which is probably what it should be, I think um, whichever of the, kind of the three lefties of Muncie, Bellinger, and Seager is hitting the best kind of over an extended period of time should hit second. And I think that's clearly been Muncie this season, and it should continue to be that way. I don't see that changing anytime soon. 
So I'd keep Monty at second and have either Seager hitting fourth or Bellinger hitting fourth, depending on who's playing better and whether they're more comfortable. I think it's kind of not super important at this point. And obviously, Robert's going to be more tuned into how the guys are feeling in that sense. But I think um, for the foreseeable future, Muncie should 100% be hitting second. But I think Bellinger is a good person to have hitting second when Muncie's getting the day off. Yep. Jake hit the nail on the head with Bellinger's defense. It's just been as good as it's been, making some incredible catches and just showing off the showing off the speed in the outfield. Coming up on the docket for the Dodgers, they go out to our nation's capital. They're taking on the Washington Nationals. And while it's a four-game set, it's not necessarily a big series for the Dodgers per se, but on the Nationals side of things, this is a chance for the Dodgers put, to put the Nationals back from contenders to sellers. So I'm very interested to see how the Dodgers approach this one. They're going to face Patrick Corbin to open it up while he is struggling this season with a 533 ERA. We just saw what Blake Snell did to us. Bad lefties just seem to have the Dodgers number and Corbin's been a guy in the past. Then they face Max Scherzer. That'll be Urias against Scherzer. Then Clayton Kershaw against a young pitcher for the Nationals, Espino. And then 4th of July, it's an 8 a.m. game Pacific time. So set your alarm up. So you wake up early, 8 a.m. Don't miss that one. Right now it's scheduled to be Trevor Bauer against Joe Ross. We'll see if that one sticks. But I remember the Dodgers faced Joe Ross a few years ago in the NLDS and Aegon smacked a huge home run off him. So let's see if they can rekindle some of that magic. And then they have four against the Marlins in Miami. So eight very winnable games. And then I believe they have the Diamondbacks for three and then they go into the All-Star game. So uh, any I mean, takeaways? This is, this is a stretch. Any takeaways? The only thing I wanted to talk about real quick was just Kyle Schwarber. This yeah. guy's been on a tear over his last ten games. He has twelve home runs hit. Jesus, that's a, that's tied for a modern day record. And hopefully the Dodgers are the team that can contain this guy because he has twenty five home runs on the season. Now I knew Schwarber was a power hitter, but I definitely did not see this type of season coming from him. Yeah. yeah, this is going to be an interesting stretch for the Dodgers. Uh, obviously, the Nationals are hot right now. I think they've won 10 out of the last 12, I believe, uh, something like that. But then after the National Series, you got four with Miami, uh, three with Arizona, the All-Star break, and then three with Colorado. Uh, so this is, a, this is a stretch where they can really do some damage here. Uh, it's similar to when they won 10 out of 12 when they played uh, Pittsburgh, Arizona, Texas, and somebody else mediocre uh so i I expect them to do yeah thank you uh i expect them to do have a similar stretch with these games uh good teams beat bad teams uh and that's what the dodgers need to do here i'm just encouraged by the the stretch that they just had minus the padres sweep but i felt like they handled the cubs and they handled the giants two um fairly good teams in the national league i was I've been looking for that from this team since the beginning is, is how they play against tough competition. And if they play well against tough competition, then the other series where they don't have as tough a competition, like in Miami, those are, you know, I don't want to say cakewalks, but they're a lot less stressful for Dodgers fans to watch those games. And um, we've been talking, we were talking about it earlier Um, that the Dodgers need this all-star break. Well, if they go into the all-star break on fire, um, maybe they need it just just to rest, but it's not as dire as we thought it once was when we were getting swept by the the Padres. And we all were kind of thinking like, why is this team just kind of meh? Like it's just kind of mediocre right now. And it's just kind of up and down and the ebbs and flows, the peaks and valleys is just so stressful. Um, But the Dodgers really could make a push and take over first place for all we know. Yeah, I think um, after we they got swept in San Diego, I remember I tweeted out something like, this is not, they're not happy. This is could, like light a fire and start a run. And then, you know, immediately they got no hit. And people are kind of like, what are you talking about? This, they're, they're, <laughs> yeah. dead in the, they're dead in the water. But then they rattle off five wins in a row. And a lot of them were kind of late inning comeback wins, very close games. They played really good baseball and easily could have lost a lot of those games, especially the ones um, against San Francisco. And I think kind of shows like this is, I think this is the start of kind of that run they usually have in the summer where they kind of just winning every game, just find a way to win games. I think, especially with the easy July schedule, we're going to see a lot of, we're going to see their best month yet, I think. Yes. I'm feeling it too. Sam, we really appreciate you joining the incline today. Are there any other subjects around the Dodgers or major league baseball you wanted to touch on real quick? Uh, I think we got pretty much everything that I was thinking of talking about, but if you guys have anything, I'm happy to 
Yeah. Keep going. Um, um, whatever you guys have is good. If either of you guys have bad tweet takes or idiots of the weeks, feel free to share them or any other quick topics. Otherwise, we'll just close it out with our final thoughts. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of idiots out there. Uh, I can't remember if I did Stephen Woods again last week. Ben and Woods. You definitely called them you've, out. You've talked about them quite a bit, but All I don't right. know. Well, maybe well, there, maybe there's, there's something new. They're my idiots of the year. Uh, so I'll just go with them again. But the only thing I want to talk about real, really quickly is you hear all this noise about the sticky stuff and how the Dodgers were the number one team affected by all this uh, spin rate decline. All right. Okay. That's fair. Tell me what Walker Bueller's done recently. Tell me what Julio Arias has rebounded since then. Tell me what Clayton Kershaw just did. So save it. Uh, spin rate is not the only thing that makes a pitcher. Uh, these pitchers are still legit. They're still good and they're still elite. That's it. And if, and if you're Blake Trinan, you never bothered with that stuff to begin with. That's right. A real man of faith. But can and I also, just the bullpen also hasn't wavered at all. They've yeah, been exactly. if they've been right. stronger, it seems. Yeah. I just want to say some yeah. I just want to say real quick, if Garrett Cole isn't legitimate proof that spider tack or whatever he use it is using is on the same playing field as performing enhancing drugs, then there's no reason to argue because what Garrett Cole is doing right now just just proof like this guy is not good and he was a scam fraud and he just robbed the yankees of 300 whatever million dollars because he's a number three at best right now it's a hell of a troll by the astros to teach him how to use spider tech and then get someone else to pay him 300 yeah. million <laughs> they didn't even i don't think they even offered him a contract because they <laughs> they knew yeah, I'm, they knew the truth the one, yeah i'm just glad it wasn't us because i remember we offered him a lot of money uh, yeah, yeah, we offered him 300, we all we in. Oh 300 million. Thank God we dodged that bullet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I actually do have an idiot of the week, and it's on that same subject as, as the Astros. It's Evan Gaddis. He was on that team. He gave a two hour interview just the other day. Uh, just to sum it up real quick, because it was two hours, like I just said. He said that the Astros didn't do anything wrong. We cheated. That's for sure. Those were his quotes. He so also that's, <laughs> that's he also, something wrong. That's the yeah. part where you did something wrong. But okay. Yeah. He also said there were members in the Astros dugout that told the other side of the Dodger side of things to cool it on the cheating talk. And he also accused other teams around the league of doing the same thing, but they kept hush hush because they didn't want to have the same investigations shine light on what they did. So that's Evan Gaddis yeah. for you, ladies and gentlemen. Also, Blanco. Look, if the Dodgers were so egregious and had this sort of similar sign stealing, you know, concoction that the Astros did, why isn't anybody talking about it? Where is the evidence? Yeah. We've seen we've seen guys come out and say, you know, and accuse the Dodgers of doing it. I forget that that one journeyman uh, that came out recently. Um, and said that it, I think he was a member of the Brewers. I, I can't even remember his name to be honest. But but the point is is that he wasn't on that team. Mike Kratz. Fires, Eric Kratz, Eric Kratz. Eric Kratz, yeah. Mike uh, Mike Fires was on that Astros team. You know where's the where's the former Dodger that's going to come out and say that? That's the only way that you're going to find out if anything happened. And my other point is is that do you really think? Remember how angry. Bellinger and Turner were before the shutdown. The this is the yeah. point. Remember right how here. angry they were? Do you do you really think that if they were that, that, that if they were so angry and behind the scenes were actually doing exactly what the Astros were doing, that they would come out and be that angry about it? Right. No it chance. Makes, it makes no sense. No. Right. No. There's so there, many there's... like logical arguments. Like also Gaddis, I don't know why the Astros would tell the Dodgers to shut up about the cheating talk while they're playing in the World Series and winning a lot of the games, it just makes you look guilty. That makes and no sense. the only evidence I've ever seen about the Dodgers cheating is you're like, oh, this guy was wearing like the wrong polo shirt. They think he was spying. What? Yeah. And it just makes – there's no logical argument for the Dodgers cheating. They go after – a lot of times it's the, the teams that are like like really good who they go after as cheating. And I think I, that was the case with the Astros. But they found proof there. They haven't found proof anywhere else. So they're just honestly grabbing it, grabbing at straws. Yeah. Glad I got you guys fired up. All right, let's close out the show. <laughs> Final thoughts, and then we're signing out. Um, 
Final thoughts real quick. I know that the Dodgers have ripped off five in a row, but I just have these stats that I want to throw out there. I think the Dodgers uh, over the next uh, couple of weeks need to improve a little bit on situational hitting, most notably with runners in scoring position. I was shocked to find out these numbers that over the last seven games, they're batting 192 with runners in scoring position, which is 29th in Major League Baseball. And they also have a 719 OPS, which is 17th in Major League Baseball. Overall this season, they're actually fifth in OPS and they're uh, ninth it, with with batting average uh, with runners in scoring position. So that was one of the things uh, in the Cub series, and and more specifically in the Giants series, um, they they squandered a lot of opportunities to score runs. And so hopefully uh, they can start manufacturing runs and and relying less on uh, solo shots and and just overall home runs. Yeah, my final thoughts. It's it's pretty simple. Uh, I. I I'd like to see him rattle off 10 out of 12 here the next the next 10 games. But more importantly, I just want this team to stay healthy. Uh, get to the all-star break healthy. Get Seager back afterwards. No more injuries. Uh, keep the division closed for now. Uh, you, can, you can close the gap after the all-star break. But just, just stay healthy. No more injuries. And, uh, and uh, hopefully we can sweep the D-backs before the, uh, before the all-star break. Uh, yeah, my... The thing I think is it's not talked about enough. I think it's the just base running on both aspects of the game for the Dodgers. I think in we saw it recently. This has been a huge problem. We don't steal a ton of bases. We also I think Taylor got picked off twice in one game. Betts got picked off at one point. I think we can clean that up a little bit. And also if Kershaw and Arias are kind of the only pitchers who are good at controlling the base running game, at least from the starting standpoint, and um, a lot of relievers are not good in it. And I think um, when you don't have a guy with a great arm, Smith and Barnes are both you know, above average with their arm, but they're not good enough to make up for kind of a lack of control of the running game. I think that could be something we could tighten up a game one, especially when playing the Padres. They take advantage of that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Once again, Sam, thank you for coming on. And I wanted to close out with this. Just want to commend you for preseason. You said Julio Urias is better than Blake Snell and you took a lot of heat. <laughs> I was on your thank side. You. Blake Snell is not good, even though for some reason he has the Dodgers number. We got to figure that part out. We know the reason why, Kevin. We know the reason why. Yeah, it's sad. But maybe the next. with the correct arm. Yeah. yeah. Next time out. But thank you all for listening to The Incline. Make sure to subscribe to us. We're all over the place. Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Google, YouTube. And follow us on Twitter. All our handles will be in the description below. I hope everyone has a great and safe 4th of July. Go hard, but not too hard. And root on your Dodgers because they got some fun games coming up and we got to beat those nationals and make up for 2019. Am I right, Jake?